Hello everybody. Today I want to tell you about Poincaré recurrence. So this is a general phenomenon that happens in dynamical systems, but I'm going to approach it from a very classical mechanics perspective and symplectic geometry perspective because this is adapted from a lecture that I gave to my classical mechanics and symplectic geometry class. And um, it's actually the sequel to a couple of videos talking about first the lead derivative and second Louisville's theorem. So that we're going to see Poincaré recurrence as a consequence of Louisville's theorem. So let's get into it. We have that the volume of phase space is preserved. On P is preserved. So here's a cute little use of it. It's called Poincaré recurrence theorem. So just to write it down. If a trajectory of some path in, in phase space describing, you know, the system state over time lies in in a finite volume region of phase space. Then it must return infinitely close to the starting point. And in fact, it does that infinitely many times. Okay. So said another way, the dynamics are recurrent. That's where recurrence comes from. So why do we care? The thing is, most systems obey this because, you know, your, your trajectories of a Hamiltonian system lie on, a, on an energy level set. So if your energy level sets are bounded, then so too is your actual thing. So for example, Let's just take phase space as the cotangent space of a manifold, and then let's define our Hamiltonian as a standard kinetic plus potential Hamiltonian. So we have our momentum squared, and then our potential. And let's say that M is finite volume. Okay? So then a level set of H, um, let's just say that So let's sketch this out a bit. So we have m here, and then we have the sort of the cotangent space um, at a given point. And then the energy set of H is just going to be a circle here, or a sphere defined by this kinetic energy term. So as long as we have p less than p naught, then that means the Hamiltonian is going to be less than h naught. So trajectory. lives here. Uh, your trajectory will never have a momentum uh, larger than a certain amount, which means that the total volume of your space is going to be bounded. So the volume is bounded. So in other words, like for a kinetic plus potential Hamiltonian, on like a finite um, configuration space, you will always have this recurrence property. So let's kind of take this to the logical stream. Okay, what about a gas on, say, a sphere, right? So then each gas, so the configuration space M is just, you know, the ball to the power of N, where N is the number of particles. And then our phase space is the cotangent bundle of the ball. 
Um, and, you know, the, the trajectory of a gas, the configuration of the gas, will always be, you know, in some finite volume region. Keep in mind that n is on the order of like 10 to the 23rd. That's how many particles there are. So the volume is like the, it's like the volume of b, the volume of your ball to the nth power, which is absurdly big. But it's still finite, right? So what this means is, if you wait long enough, then the gas, you know, if you start with, say, all of the gas in one corner of the room, then as time goes on, you'll get this, like, it does what you'd expect. It goes everywhere, and then it, you know, it fermalizes. But the thing is, if you wait long enough, at some point, it will all end up back in the corner. And in fact, it will do this infinitely many times into the future. Which is kind of cool. So to illustrate this, here's a tweet from um, the wonderful Matt Henderson. And it starts with a gas where there's two compartments. All of the gas starts in one region. And as time goes on, you know, it behaves as you'd expect. You know, the gas flies around and sort of equalizes between the two chambers. But then something unexpected happens. Let's, let's just sit and sit and watch this. You see that the concentrations are getting a little bit uneven, and suddenly, oh, there you go. They all ended up back in the first chamber, right? So this is what happened if you were to wait long enough. Now, of course, in real life, since the volume is on the order of like 10 to the 23rd, then how long would it actually take for this to happen? Like, you know, probably longer than the observable universe has been around. Uh, but this one only happened in 46 seconds. So let's go back to the proof. Why is Poincaré recurrence true? Well, I'm going to use something I like to call proof by hungry worm. So suppose that the trajectory never gets within some region of the starting point. Let's call that B epsilon, where epsilon is just some number, a ball radius epsilon. About x naught. So let's call the trajectory x of t. Okay? So now let's define a worm as a set in this thing, W, S, say, which is the union for all times less than S of what you get when you translate this ball around by time t. Essentially, you take the ball and you extrude it out into a worm. Okay? So, here's our worm. Here's x naught. Here's x of t. Here is time s. And here's a smiley face. So why is this a hungry worm? Well, think about it as the worm starts in an apple, a finite volume apple. And, you know, as a little baby worm, it's just a point, right? It's just a point here. But as it goes on, what it does is it eats the apple and turns all of the apple that it eats into worm body length. And essentially it just extrudes out like that. You know, just like the, the snakes in the snake game. And as the worm goes along, it keeps eating and eating and eating. Now, just essentially by the fact that the volume of the worm grows over time, eventually, Mr. Worm runs out of apple. Oh no! Which means that eventually your worm, the Mr. Worm's gonna have to start eating itself. Um, Auto-cannibalism in the, in the worm kingdom. Okay, so what happens when that happens? Well, let's draw it eating itself. Okay? So there's this sort of overlap region here, 
where it took a chunk out of everything else. Now, the thing is, by the reversibility of this flow, you know, the picture can't actually look like this because let's call this overlap region, say, S, right? Because phi of, you know, T, S, um, is an element, phi of T, S for any T, is a subset of both the top and bottom trajectory, right? So if we extrude it out like this, the amount that it eats, it can't just be localized in one region, it has to be invariant under the flow. Okay. Which in particular means that, you know, since it's reversible, I can take any point and move it back to the beginning and put this into this ball of radius epsilon at, at the origin, which essentially means that at some point in time, um, the worm must eat its tail, right? The, the overlap region between these two sets must intersect with the starting region, which means that the trajectory x of t gets within 2 epsilon of the start. And we can set epsilon to anything we want. So we can make it as small as we want. So essentially, by, by Hungry Worm Theorem, by a continuous version of, of the pigeonhole principle, basically, and then by the invariance under the flow, we can see that the worm must always eat its tail. And after it does it once, well, then you can just do the same argument again to say, OK, well, it has to do it again after that, so on and so forth. And there we get Poincaré recurrence theorem. So I lied a little bit here because, you know, the way that I implied that this was sort of the, the way I laid it out makes it seem like this is true for every single point in, in, your, in your apple, any point in phase space. Um, that's not quite true because there are some points where it might not return. But what we do know is that the volume of those points has to be zero. Um, now, to do this properly needs a much better notion of what volume is, because right now we have volume as something you assign to n-dimensional manifolds and nothing else, and that won't cut it. So to do this for realsies, we're going to need um, something called measure theory. And it's all very cool, but unfortunately way outside the scope of this video.